Miller, welcome to the I Love Seville show. Thank you kindly for joining us. Love connecting with you guys through this network on a show that airs on all social channels. Our hope with the program is just to relay local information to you and at a time where Central Virginia has become a news desert. So while this show requires a lot of work and while there's an opportunity cost of my time doing this show where otherwise I could be doing more profitable endeavors... I continue to do the program because A, I enjoy doing it. I'm a news junkie and I enjoy communicating and connecting with you guys. And I also realize that there's a need for this locally. Um, we spend significant hours every week doing this program. And I highlight on the show that this is a profitable venture, a business running in the black, the I Love Seville network, um, but not even a top four revenue stream for the company. The reason we do this is passion for local news and an understanding that all of us want more of it and we're in this changing time where legacy media is not reinventing itself to cater to our needs today. We have, because we're small, the skill of adapting and pivoting quickly. That's what we've done with this network. I don't know if you noticed yesterday, but um, Tucker Carlson, who was fired by Fox News, Tucker, Tucker Carlson released his first episode on Twitter. It's called Tucker on Twitter. And what Tucker Carlson is doing on Twitter is he's going to do a live show every day on the platform, a platform he says that is free of gatekeepers, which is clearly him throwing shade at his, at his former bosses of Fox News. So here you have a broadcaster of global proportions, Tucker Carlson, that is now live streaming his content on social media so he can be the sole owner of his content and the sole shot caller of his content. Guys, we've been doing that exact business model for five years and change now. Five years and change. That's what we've been doing. All right. A lot I want to cover on the show. If you can look at the screen, um, you'll see the headlines for today. I've been talking about this Pledge of Allegiance indoctrination. Sarah K. Harris, the Albemarle County Public Schools Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee member, put on Twitter over the weekend that the Pledge of Allegiance is indoctrination. I had probably... Let's, be, let's use a conservative number. I'm going to say at least 100 people have reached out to me about that tweet and about us covering it on the show. One person highlighted to me that I missed something with the analysis. Sarah K. Harris is not only Almoral County Public Schools Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee member, she's also the president of Forward Almoral. And Forward Almoral can be found online at forwardalmoral.com. Forward Albemarle is an organization that is um, focused on making sure ACPS is as progressive as possible in its curriculum and its policies. I think that's fair to say. Sarah, she's the president of this organization. This organization um, wrote a fairly scathing um, analysis of the at-large race in Almaro County with the school board that has Allison Spillman and Dr. Meg Bryce going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And in this very scathing um, commentary about Dr. Bryce um, that utilize pretty, I think, pretty sad and pathetic low-hanging fruit, like her ties to her late father, I think that's sad, pathetic, low-hanging fruit to try to utilize that against her. It's her dad. Yeah. No um, other sad and pathetic, low-hanging fruit that I saw in this scathing commentary about Dr. Bryce was her ties to national political parties. Why that would matter at the local level, I do not know. Mm -hmm. I do not know. Um, one of the key issues that Forward Almoral has with Dr. Bryce is the communication between parents and teachers as it pertains to students who identify as the opposite sex in hallways of schools. 
Dr. Bryce wants teachers to let parents know that their son or daughter is identifying as the opposite sex in hallways. That seems pretty reasonable to me. Forward Albemarle has a problem with that. So here's the question and what we're going to do today. Does Dr. Meg Bryce, in her campaign for the at-large seat of the Albemarle County School Board, does she mention at all in her campaign, and I'm just throwing a hypothetical out there, should she mention at all in her campaign that a former teacher of Albemarle County Public Schools who's on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee of ACPS and is the president of Forward Almaro, who wrote some nasty stuff about her, is talking about on Twitter that the Pledge of Allegiance is indoctrination. I'm curious about that. I'll ask that question with Judah. I would think that would be something Dr. Bryce should bring up. That's just my two cents. I also, on today's show, I want to talk about um, Sean Tubbs' article in the Seville Weekly about the High Street parcel. That's in the, how would I describe this parcel? In the crossfire? I'd say this land on High Street by the Rivanna River is in the crossfire. You got the neighborhood around it that doesn't want it developed. You got Wendell Wood, who owns it, who again is in the catbird seat. And you got Bo Carrington, the Covenant School graduate, played lacrosse at Duke, now a businessman, who's under contract to purchase it from Wendell. So you got a lot of moving parts. Sean Tubbs had a good article in the Seville Weekly about this that I'm going to try to unpack for you guys and kind of like a 7th, 8th grade, ninth grade layman um, type of level so we all can understand the nuance of this storyline. I also want to highlight um, a message sent to me this morning by a stakeholder that I admire and respect, um, a friend, and John Blair, who said that there's only two lots in Almar County under one acre that are available currently for building. That's scary. Two lots only in Almaro currently on the MLS available for purchase that are under one acre. That's scary. We'll talk about that on today's program. First, I'll start with um, prayers to the families uh, of the shooting yesterday in Richmond. You've seen it by now. why someone would do something like that at graduation at a time of happiness where it's supposed to be a time that you would remember for the rest of your life. I remember my high school graduation like it was yesterday. Family and friends come to celebrate and, and say great work for all your 13 years of effort. Instead, the memory is two dead, many injured, some running for their lives from the shooter got hit by a car. That's the memory. That's the memory. I was disappointed with a handful of um, Virginia politicians who utilized the opportunity to champion gun rights. Winsome Sears comes to mind. When the moment is that raw and real and vulnerable, don't steal the stage to pitch your policies on weapons. It makes you look like you lack emotional intelligence. Instead, utilize the opportunity to help heal and hug and love and comfort. And those healing, hugging, comfort, and loving qualities are something that I legitimately see um, every day from my wife, from moms everywhere. And there's a lot of moms that watch this program. I saw this post on social media that was making the rounds, and I, and I wanted to read it. This is an opportunity to celebrate and champion the moms out there, especially the stay-at-home moms. My better half is one of those. And staying home with a, a five-year-old that goes 1,000 miles an hour from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night, literally 1,000 miles an hour, does not need a nap, does not stop, does not need a break, literally knows nothing but relentless speed. That's our oldest. 
and then also having a six-month-old in your arms while you're trying to corral this speed demon, that's one of the most difficult jobs I've ever seen. I saw this post on social media that I felt um, I should throw, I should read. It resonated with me, and it made me a little emotional last night. Getting a little emotional now. I just don't take enough time to say thank you, and I should. So maybe parents out there, if you have a partner that stays home, and maybe it's the dad that stays home, maybe it's the mom that stays home, consider what I'm about to say and maybe relay this to your, your, your partner when you get back to your domicile. Um, for the exhausted woman who showers a few minutes longer to cry with the water, for the person hidden in the bathroom because she needs a few minutes of tranquility while slipping tears from her eyes, for the woman who is so tired that she feels she cannot continue, that she would give anything to feel like herself again, for the woman who cries in her room when everyone leaves the house and for a moment she lets go, for the woman who desperately battles with self-confidence when wearing denim pants because she wants to look pretty and wear them to feel better, but everything just climbs over and can't close. For the woman who orders pizza for dinner because she did not have the time to make dinner again as she expected because she's tired. For the woman who feels alone even when she's accompanied. You are worth a lot. You are important. You are enough. You are wonderful. I love you. That meant a lot to me. I think sometimes we take for granted, we take for granted how difficult doing the same thing every day can be. And we attribute it to, hey, it's a habit. You're doing it all the time. You should be great at it. It should be effortless for you now because you practice it every day. We don't realize that that's grinding. And we don't realize that often when you're a stay-at-home parent, the loved one you are watching is a kid and emotional. And they do random, unpredictable, stupid things because they're a child. And that's difficult to manage. So for the moms and dads that are out there that are watching the show, you guys are heroes. Heroes. Because you allow people like me to pursue entrepreneurial endeavors that match my passion. And I go to work and I get to do something that I love. Sometimes it doesn't even feel like work. And I have that opportunity. Because I have someone at home that I can count on. So, I wanted to start the show that way. I don't know why I'm getting emotional on this. Uh, all right. Just got, I just can't, it's just so hard when you see like, you know, moms and dads at a graduation in Richmond and a shooting. And then you read this. Hmm. All right. Let's go to some uh, local topics, okay? Why don't we start, and I can weave you in on this one, because, Judah, I'm going to need a little bit of stabilization right now from you as I uh, catch my breath. Uh, 
the Pledge of Allegiance topic, because I've, I've just been floored by this. You can tell this is the third day I've brought it up. I've been shocked with the response from the viewers and listeners about this. You know what I'm finding, man, is there's this... It's all right if it's not there. Yeah. You know what I'm finding is... There's so many moms and dads in Albemarle that are afraid to speak up of changes in their school because they're afraid to be labeled something by a vocal, organized minority. And I'm getting all these direct messages and these emails and these text messages from people that listen to the show where we talked about the Pledge of Allegiance and how literally there's a, a lady that's the president of Forward Albemarle, the progressive lobbying group that's trying to push this school system into areas of curriculum that I'm literally taking aback and left mouth agape that we're heading in that way. This particular individual is not only the president of this lobbying group, she's on the Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of Almar County Public Schools. She has the ear of many of the teachers within ACPS, and she's offering scathing commentary, scathing commentary of a candidate that is running in the general election school board race and Dr. Bryce. The response I've heard from viewers and listeners has been overwhelming. How do you even allude that the Pledge of Allegiance is indoctrination? Right. That's been the, over, the response. How can she even allude to this when she's the president of this lobbying group, when she's on the Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, when she's a former teacher herself, and she has a platform of influence? She writes some nasty stuff about Bryce. Yeah. And a lot of it's seemingly irrelevant from what, I, from what I heard, from what I remember hearing when you, when you read it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, get that, uh, <clears throat> I get that the two sides don't really like each other, but, uh, but saying that someone is, uh, is uh, what's the word, in, uh, incapable, I don't think that was quite the word, but uh, saying that someone is, is not right for, a, for something like a seat on the school board. Because That's what she said. Simply because they're a Republican? And, and because she's a daughter of a Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Late. Maybe even more pointed because she wants teachers and administrators within the school system to tell parents that their children are identifying as the opposite sex. When teachers and administrators keep secrets from parents, that's not, that's bad. Yeah. Leadership. Adults that are around children should not be encouraging the children to keep secrets from their parents. Right. If there's a problem with the parents and the children, then something should be done about it. But if you have not identified a problem with the parents, then there, I don't see any possible reason why you would, why you would be keeping secrets from them. Yeah. How are we even having this conversation in Al Morrow? You have a lobbying group that legitimately is using its platform to say it's okay for employees of the school system to keep secrets from parents. Yeah, that's nuts. It's one thing. It's, it's okay. I, I should caveat this. It's one thing if the school system knows the mom and dad is doing bad things to the kid. Maybe right. the parents are beating the kids. Maybe well, they're doing... Well, like I said, that's, that's when somebody should step in and it shouldn't be... It shouldn't be a question of... Then it goes to CPS. It shouldn't be a question of, do we keep secrets from the... There sh, that shouldn't even come up. Right. If there's a problem with, where the parents are abusing the children... They intervene. Yeah. Right? The, it does, you don't sit around and wait until the child tells you, their, you know, tells you some secret that they have from the parents and then decide whether or not to keep the secret. No. The, the time for action was when you, fr when you found out there was an issue with the family. Exactly. Exactly. And so saying that for some reason teachers should not only keep secrets from the family themselves but uh, administrators and, and that they should and that they should what? 
convince or influence the children into keeping secrets from their parents as well? I just, that, that sounds, if you were a doctor, that would be, that would be grounds for malpractice. Unpack that. I, I mean, put it in any other, couch it in any other term. Say the kid has, uh, say the kid has a, uh, an infection. Would you, would you advise the, the child to not tell their parents about it? Would you keep that infection from the parents? Would you, would you, ad, would you uh, ask at the school administration to keep that information from the parents? And if, uh, and if the, heaven forbid, something serious happened to the child because that information was withheld, I, that's, I'm pretty sure that's major, major grounds for, for a lawsuit. And yet, somehow it's okay to like hide from parents something as major as how, yes. how a, child, a child feels about their sexuality. sexuality. I mean, I'm not even going to get into the, the morality one way or the other. In terms of no, that's of not what, what we're talking about. Going through, yeah, that's but not what we're talking about. The fact that you would, the fact that you would try to keep that from a parent for any reason is just, is just unconscionable. And and it, and again, if it was couched in any other terms, like, you know, like medical, you know, a medical problem with the child, nobody would bat an eye that we're saying that the parent should one hundred percent have knowledge of what's going on. <laughs> Bingo. So why are we making this? Why are we, we separating these issues here? There it is. There it is. Give me a good reason why you would you would keep information like this from a parent. And again, if there is a problem with the parents, then that, something should be that's done. That's different. About it. If you don't want to tell the parents because you think the parents are going to do something to their child, abuse. That's different. Out, then. Help the child get away from the parents, but don't make it just like this is a secret. Right? How? I mean, most parents, when given <laughs> the, make any sense. Most parents, when given the opportunity, maj- large majority of parents, when given the opportunity to pause and reflect on something like this, maybe a gender change of their kid. Most parents, when they reflect and pause. I would bet would rise to the occasion and end up supporting their kid anyway because it's their child. And regardless... And regardless, it's not the job of the teacher or the administrator to... Manage to sexualities. Make, to make suppositions about how a parent will react when they hear something. And or manage sexualities. Yeah. But even more than that. When you go to the Curry School of Education, are you taking 15 credits and managing sexualities? Probably not. So I got to ask you this question, man. If you're Dr. Bryce and you're running this campaign and you're going for this at-large seat on the school board in the general election, how do you utilize this information? You got the president of a lobbying group called Forward Albemarle that put a tweet out over the weekend that said the Pledge of Allegiance is indoctrination. The same president of this lobbying group is on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee within ACPS and was a former teacher within Albemarle and is passionately endorsing your direct competition Allison Spillman in the race. It would seem to me, and I'm just an independent third party here, that this is something that should be brought to everyone's attention. Because if the writer of this scathing, this is who you should vote for, I'm utilizing the lobbying platform Forward Out Moral to tell you who to vote, If she's doing this scathing commentary and then utilizing her social media on the weekend to make allusions to the Pledge of Allegiance being indoctrination, that seems like the community should know about it. And it seemed like it would very much marginalize the endorsement she made. 
Because it questions your, it makes you question her judgment. And when you question her judgment, you think twice about the commentary she's writing. I mean, just reading the commentary makes you kind of, I don't know about question her judgment, but question her, uh, her ability to, uh, to read information. Uh, Lead our children? Well, I just mean some of the accusations are, I mean, like, like you said, uh, are we really uh, are we really at a place where accusing someone of being a child of someone else is is a is is that is that a a, a good argument? I mean, is that something that you're saying? Her daughter, late Supreme Court justice, yeah, like conservative it, tendencies. That's what they're doing. Like, if I go for a job and somebody what an insult to doesn't her like my dad, is that grounds for not hiring me? I know. It's is, just, are, are we are we really at that point where we'll we'll vilify someone because of their because of their parents? I would even take it a step further that what Sarah Harris is doing there by associating Dr. Bryce to her father and utilizing that to knock down Dr. Bryce, that tactic that Sarah Harris is using and forward Almoro is legitimately setting women back. Because she's basically saying this yeah. person can't think for herself. She's only thinking as her, man, her daddy, a male, was thinking like. Sarah yeah. Harris is legitimately sexism argument. and marginalizing women with this commentary. Yeah. That's basically what she's saying. That right. Dr. Price can't, can't do anything be, be, without her daddy. She's just a, she's just a clone uh, the of, puppet. of a man. Yeah, that's what she's saying. She's setting women back with this commentary. I want you to realize that. You do realize that. Viewers and listeners, I yeah. hope you realize that. And that's one of the reasons I started the show that way, by championing and, 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 and going hardcore and, 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 ch- and celebrating my wife and all those stay-at-home moms out there. All these women that we literally know are the superheroes. You see a nine-pound bowling ball come out in your wife's vagina twice, and you realize you personally don't have the courage to do that yourself. And then you realize that the person you marry to has much more superhero strength than you ever did. Well, even disregarding the, uh, even disregarding all of that, I mean, can't we just, can't we just look at, uh, can't we just look at candidates in any, you know, in any race for any position, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's at the state level or the, uh, the national level, or you know, right here in, in our own backyards, can't we just look at, look at candidates uh, and and assess their worthiness based on, you know, facts and not stuff like who your parents are or whether or not you're a, uh, you know, I mean, is, is someone's political leaning actually a fact that you use? I mean, I, obviously, Democrats are not very likely to vote for Republicans in any race. And the same goes the other way around. Republicans are very unlikely to be voting for Democrats. But... Do you have to point that out? I mean, do you have to say this person is unfit to lead because they're a Democrat or this person shouldn't be in a position of leadership because they're a Republican? Judah Wickhauer is on point today, dude. You're on point today. I mean, that's what scares me the most is the fact that we've, we've, I, it's, it's always been like this to some extent. You know? Make the point we, you made earlier about like, why would anyone run for any of these things of merit? Um, I don't know if I remember what I, I mean. It was a fantastic point. Look at the nastiness she's facing for a school board seat. That what is the Almaro County School Board pay people? Almaro County School Board salary. I mean, what is it? It's like pennies. It's nothing for the work that they put in. Let's see. I'll see if I can find an article. Make the point you made. Why would anyone run for these seats? I mean, I don't remember that specific. Uh argument but yeah i seriously if this is what you expect uh i mean look at the look at the you know what show with um with laufer and uh, squire yeah and squire it's i mean and this is and these are people on the same side of the aisle these are both democrats that literally were friends two weeks ago where laufer is literally saying we're the exact same candidate i just have more experience than him she was the chairwoman of the albaro county Democratic Party, yeah, in charge of driving this party forward. 
after a handful of months, quits this chairwoman, gets in this race, moves houses. I think she moved from Almoro into the city, Lawford did. And now look what's happened. Yeah. I, it's Dude, I flirted with supervisor race. Everyone watching this program knows this. You know why I wanted to do it? Because I love this town, and I love this area, and it's been really good to me and my family. I got great clients, some of them watching the program as we speak. We work real, real hard for them. I, I had an opportunity to build a business, been self-employed for 15 years. I love this town. One of my business called I Love Seville. I felt compelled to give back. It was not for money. I think they make 17K and they work like 35 hours a week. 17K a year, they work like 35 hours a week. It wasn't the money. Yeah. It's because I felt compelled to give back. Talk about this, flirt it, do it about it. The vitriol and the nastiness you receive. And I hadn't even officially entered. Yeah. Imagine if it was crunch time and the race was close. And you know how, who Almoral County is going to get in the Board of Supervisors in the Scottsville District? You want to know who they're going to get? His name is Mike Pruitt. He's a UVA student at the law school. He's never had a job in the private sector. He has been in the Navy. He's never had a job in the private sector. Legitimately is a law school student at UVA. This is going to be your supervisor. He got his house, bought, he's had one house, which he bought with the help of his parents. The guy is 30 years old, 31 years old. This is who you are left to take the leadership reigns because no one else wants to do it. Mike, you are going to spend four years of your life having half the community hate your guts. Mike, you're going to spend four years of your life working 35 to 50 hours a week for an indentured servant's pay. Mike, these four years of you serving on the board, the opportunity cost is going to be tremendous where you, when you reflect, are going to realize Good Lord, I've lost out on maybe five hundred or six hundred thousand dollars in opportunity costs from salary. And when your time on this board is over, because I doubt you're going to run again, no one's going to remember your name fifteen years from now. That's your legacy, and that's what he has in front of him. How many people can name the Samuel Miller District? Board of Supervisor representative in Almore County right now. Can you? The what? Who's the supervisor from the Samuel Miller District in Almore County? Uh, I'm the wrong person to ask about any of that stuff. Anyone listening to this program, the only one I think that could possibly do this right off, right immediately is John, who's watching on LinkedIn. I know he could do that. Who can name the Board of Supervisor Samuel Miller District member? The guy who is in charge of the Samuel Miller District, that's like Redfield's... That's a lot of like Southside, Almoral County. Who can name the guy? Neil could do it. Of course Neil can do it. <laughs> Who else could do it? There's my point. Yeah. No one even knows. It's going to know who Mike is. The guy's name is Jim Andrews. Took over for Liz Palmer. The only reason I know this is because I'm a junkie for this stuff. I live for this stuff. 31-year-old is going to leave a lead is a 31-year-old is going to be one of six people leading a $500 million plus budget, and he's never had any kind of professional real-life work experience outside of his time in the Navy. Okay. I, I mean, I, don't, I honestly don't know. I, his time in the Navy could have, uh, could have equipped him quite well. To run a $550 million county? I mean, how many of the people that actually get those positions are... I would much rather a small business owner to to run a $550 million budget who's accustomed to managing a budget than a guy who has to get in a a Navy uniform. That's fair. But how many of the other, how many of the other uh, members of of the, how many, uh, how many other others of them are those things? How many of the others have, uh, have run businesses? Ned Galloway's run a business. Okay. That's one. Ned Galloway's run a business. Diantha McKeel has not run a business. Ann Malik certainly has not run a business. I don't think B. Lapisto currently has run a business. Jim Andrews at one time has been in business. He's Samuel Miller. The point Judah's making, the point I'm trying to make, because it's so nat, you have a lobbying group attacking a woman, marginalizing 
her independence as a thought leader by saying she's nothing except her father. Mm -hmm. And this is in a school board race that pays nothing. Yeah. That is the entry level of local politics. Mm -hmm. Why would anyone capable? Why would I do this? Yeah. It's not like you can, it's not like if you're, if you're, if your income is going to anything, for instance, uh, you know, mortgage, bills, you, all the above. You I'm a one income household. You couldn't possibly quit your job to, to take this on because it doesn't pay enough. So instead, you got the elderly, the elderly, the, the independent, independent, independently wealthy. wealthy. Yeah. And a single man that had his parents help buy his house that's never had a job professionally in his life. That's a student at law school. Yeah, or somebody having everything paid for them or, you know, living, you know. There you go, Al Morrow County. He's going to help you run a $500 plus million dollar budget. John Lowry makes this, sends me this email. John Lowry is the chairman of the Al Morrow County um, Republican Party. He sends this email. He says, The Almoro County Board of Supervisors is planning to purchase approximately 462 acres in the Rivanna Magisterial District for about $58 million. The vision for this purchase is to solidify the long-term vibrancy of Rivanna Station in Almoro. Economic development officials have worked through a limited liability company called Rivanna Station Futures to negotiate the purchase of land through the sale of revenue bonds. John Lowry asked this question. Viewers and listeners, listen to this question that John Lowry asks. He says, 462 acres for $58 million is $125,000 an acre. Does that not sound awfully high? John Lowry also says, some of the land is in the rural area and cannot be developed. Why not redraw the comp plan to bring all the land into the developmental area? John Lowry also says this, the vision is 100 acres of the total will be hosting future buildings owned by the U.S. government, like the present three buildings at Rivanna are currently on 25 acres. That means about 362 acres will be owned by Almaro County. John asked this question. Isn't this like having the county in the business of being in business? Doesn't this sound like government is getting free land? What is to stop the federal government from changing its mind and going someplace else that has a better offer? If the county then owns the land, who else would want to buy it? He then highlights that the, the economic development director of Almar County is no longer at Almar. His name is Roger Johnson. I'm absolutely shocked that this is not getting more attention. Roger Johnson has pieced out and left the building. The director of economic development in Almoro, Roger Johnson, sayonara, has pieced out. That dude was a huge asset to Almoro. What media outlet in central Virginia has highlighted the fact that the director of development in Almoro County is no longer at Albemarle? I cannot think of a single one. Has anyone written anything about that? That's a big deal. So who's advising in, the, in this situation? Is it a 31-year-old former Navy officer that's a UVA law student that's never had a professional job or had to manage a budget in his life? That's the person calling the shots now, dog. Does that not worry you, Almore County taxpayers? You got Ann Malik, who's on her either fourth or fifth term. If anyone thinks the podcaster from Crozet, Brad something can beat Ann Malik, you're huffing glue. You're huffing glue. Pruitt's running unopposed. The pistol Kirtley might actually have some competition from the Freebridge Auto Scion, TJ Fadley. Am I getting your last name right, TJ Fadley? He may offer her some competition. Time will tell. The pistol Kirtley has the advantage of being the incumbent. That's a huge advantage. 
My point is, you're negotiating with the federal government on $125,000 an acre, a 50-some million dollar purchase, and you're going to have a 31-year-old who's never had a real job in the, in, the, in the private sector. I'm not marginalizing Navy. I'm not marginalizing Navy. Don't let anybody say I'm marginalizing. He's never worked in the private sector or how to manage a budget. Dr. Bryce, I would utilize the Pledge of Allegiance indoctrination tweet. That needs to get out there. Just a suggestion. I'll get to all the comments. If you guys have comments for the show, put them in the feed. Uh, Linnell on Twitter, um, I thank you, Linnell, for sharing this. She shares a tweet, including a video link on my Twitter feed. I just retweeted it. I would encourage everyone to look at it. She says in her tweet, Linnell, Sarah's myth busting on student restrooms is at the one minute and 16 second mark. This is Sarah Harris. She states that there is zero evidence of males gaining access to female bathrooms in order to assault and that it's not an Almaro County public school transgender policy issue. Anyone know what happened in Loudoun County Public Schools? Loudoun County Public Schools had this issue where a student identified as the opposite sex went into the restroom and assaulted a female student. The superintendent then became aware of this assault in the bathroom and wanted to keep it hush-hush because he, the superintendent realized this was going to be a Pandora's box that was about to blow the F up mm -hmm. and said, let's keep this on the DL and let's move this student to another school. And that student did it a second time. That superintendent got pink slipped, rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully so. Yeah. You can make a direct line, point A to point B, that student number two was assaulted because of that decision. Am I right? Is that fair? That's, yeah, that's... Especially when they're the fair. superintendent? I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say that they were assaulted because of it, but uh, it, was, it was definitely a, an entirely preventable situation. Thank you. And a superintendent's role is to have the vision to prevent risk to students. Well, the superintendent's role is to... Keep protect, students safe. Protect the students. There it is. If you're not doing that, what are you, what are you there for? There it is. There it is. The tough question is this. Is she too kind to use this uh, in, in the campaign? I don't know. Is too kind to use this in the campaign is Dr. Bryce. Because she's a kind person. She may not use this specifically. And, and this the number one target against is her is saying the Pledge of Allegiance is indoctrination. The more, number one target against her, who wrote a scathing commentary, why not to vote for her, basically just tying her to her dad, marginalizing her independence, independence as a thought leader as a woman. Basically, Sarah Harris said she can't think for herself because she's this man's daughter. It's what she's doing. Well, she certainly has... The, the topics in front of her that she needs to Dude, I would use this, Meg. I would use this. This is ammo for you. It's completely your call to make. I got nothing to do with what you're doing. I just read the tea leaves. This is mm. an opportunity. But is it really, it's, is it really ammo against her, uh, her opponent? Because this is not her opponent attacking her with this. It's the number one champion of her opponent that's doing this. That's fair. Not only the number one champion of her opponent, but a former teacher, one of the leaders no. of diversity, equity, and inclusion within know, ACPS. But it's, not, but it's not her opponent. And the president of Forward Outmore. Right. All she has mm -hmm. to say is, this is the direction our schools are going. 
Here's the president of Ford, Al Morrow, a former teacher who's on the committee of DEI. What she would... tweeted over the weekend that the Pledge of Allegiance is indoctrination. Is this the direction you want ACPS schools to go and leave it as an open-ended question and allow voters to make their mind? That's how I would play it. That's fair. I would say, I would say look, this is what my opposition is saying about me, and my opponent has not come out in any way to denounce this type of, uh, you know, this type of attack. These are the facts, and then go down through the, the list of what, uh, what you, she's being accused of by Harris and say, look, my father has nothing to do with my, with my running for this position. Uh, the fact that I'm a Republican has nothing to do with the fact of me running for this position. And just run down through, you know, common sense answers to, to some of these accusations. And you know what happens when you do that? She has to, she no, has, but no, what, she has to address some of this at some point, you, right? You, the number, th number one thing she's going to have to address is the communication with the parents and the teachers when it comes to sexuality and students changing from home to school. Because that's the, the, the chess piece most used against. The second chess piece most used against the conservative ties. Third, probably ties to that. Ties, uh, uh, number two and number three are bogus. Anyone can see through that. That's flimsy, uh, flimsy logic, stupid logic. Someone who says number two and three ties to dad or ties to conservative party, those people are desperate. That's and, desperation. The first one is legitimate. Would, and they would never vote for her anyways. And they, exactly. They would never have earned the vote anyway. They're the first one's a legitimate point. Has to talk about that. The first one, parent, teacher, communication, students, trans, that's one that has to be discussed. That's legitimate campaign issue. But if she does exactly what you said, where I'm going to go through this list and just be straightforward and answer those questions, you know what that would do? It would humanize, localize, and personalize her, Dr. Bryce, and make her even more electable. Right. Because she's getting in front of the heat, taking the heat, and then answering the heat with common sense communicative answers. And a lot of people won't, a lot of normal everyday people who aren't, uh, you know, who aren't firmly on one side or the other, I think will, you know, who see this type of accusation, they don't break it down into its constituent parts and say, okay, that's absurd, that's absurd, I'd like an answer here. They look at it and it kind of, you know, this, it's this, uh, you know, it's this single argument that has a certain, uh, I, I guess a certain gravity, and and so I think I think if she uh, you know she needs to she needs to pull it apart. What do you mean for, a single argument that has a certain gravity? They're trying to lump some. It's like when you go to a. It's a because like we, you know we've gone through the facts. It's it's not all one. These aren't tied together. All of the stuff that's being said about uh, about her is not about uh, about Dr. Bryce is not a single argument or accusation. But some people may take all, may, some people may agree with one point in the overall argument and then take the rest of the argument as fact. Yeah, 100% right. 100% right. I mean, that's basically what Lawfer's trying to do with Squire, yeah. with the mailers. Yeah, it's like, like you said, most most. Most people will, if given any one of those individual facts, would say, okay, I call BS on that. But like when you said, lump it together, it's like, it's like, when, you go, it's like when you go to a, um, a yard sale. When you buy one item, it costs $10. But if you can package five items together, you get a price break. You're packaging it together. When you can take a bunch of different things and conflate them into one, yeah. you're building a bigger package of concern. Right. When those individual things were left in a silo by themselves, people would call bullshit. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And so you've got to... You and know, Forward Albemarle is the one that's leading this conflating... Right. Read the... the go forwardalmoral.com. Click blog. Forwardalmoral.com. Click blog. The headline is Meet the At-Large Candidates. It was written on April 9th, 2023. I'm literally looking at it. Meet the at-large candidates. The president is the lady over the weekend who said the Pledge of Allegiance is in indoctrination. 
I, Dr. Bryce, I don't know if you're watching. I'm, I, I think you are watching right now. I legitimately have had, I would say, somewhere between 100 and 125 individual people reach out to me about this storyline, the Pledge of Allegiance and indoctrination. And it's all been with the same response of flabbergast, anger, is this really our schools are going? Just a heads up. All right, um, 124, wow, time is flying. Um, two other topics I need to get to. This from friend of the program, John Blair, I think he's watching on LinkedIn. He sent me this message, and he, I asked him before I talked about it on the show, do I have your permission to talk about this today? And he said, yes, I never highlight something that's sent to me without getting approval and permission from the person first. One of the ways, one of the reasons why I have, get all this information that I relay to you on the show is because the people that give me the information understand that my word is my bond and I will not betray or break their trust. I am a lot of things in life, and a lot of them aren't great. But one of the things someone can't use against me is loyalty. My word is my bond. I asked him, can I talk about this? He said, sure. There's two lots in Almoral County, two lots in the entire county of Almoral, Judah, under one acre that are currently buildable for development. There's only two lots under one acre in Almoral County that you can purchase to build a house on. That is a microcosm of the affordability issues we're having. That is the microcosm of the demand that is in Albemarle. People want to be here. That is a microcosm of inflation, labor shortage, supply issues. That is a microcosm of collateral damage from COVID. All these, that is a microcosm of uh, uh, inflationary, this inflationary environment with rates that we're in. Two lots in Albemarle County under an acre to build. I, Keith? I think a similar story is, uh, there was a, there's a story in uh, the paper about, uh, about the elderly, uh, less, and less and less uh, elderly in in uh, the city of Charlottesville and more and more in surrounding areas because as they age out of their homes, those homes are getting snatched up by, uh, you know, by... Millennials. Yeah, by people that have the money. And uh, this is just not a... Um, it's not, a, obviously, a friendly area to build or buy a home. And unless... relay the, the utility story we, we percolated prior oh, to yeah. the show. Well, the um, the city is uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, Charlottesville could be raising utility rates. Um, the proposed rate that would go into effect at the beginning of next month would be would be increased almost seven and a half percent. That's uh, I don't, I'm not sure how they figured that's nearly a ten dollar increase. I guess they're just averaging what people's utilities are. Anyways, um, the city, city council says this would be a real impact on the cost of living, as if we needed them to tell us that. Right. So, and, and, and at the same time, city council is considering purchasing land owned by Wendell Wood that Bo Carrington has under contract on High Street, utilizing taxpayer dollars to buy this land that's in a floodplain, but land that by right by right, can do a 245-unit apartment complex on it. Charlottesvillians in this neighborhood are campaigning, they're petitioning, they're lobbying, they're begging, they're asking, they're employing, yeah. imploring, imploring the council, imploring the council to buy this land. Yeah, when I, when I go to church, I see signs up all, all, down, uh, all up and down uh, Chesapeake um, into... Uh, uh, some of the areas off the side streets, uh, Riverside, where my where my church is, I see signs all over the place saying "No building on the floodplain." How is a government pro affordable housing? How is a government pro upzoning? 
How is the government pro increase the housing stock so we can get housing pricing to stabilize? If we increase the supply, prices will go down and this will allow more people affordable units to live in. How is that mindset? Not a direct contradiction or the definition of hypocrisy, buying land to keep housing from being birthed. Yeah. Help me, please help me understand. You're the reasonable one here. Charlottesville City Hall says we're pro-affordable housing. Charlottesville City Hall says we're pro uh, getting working class people in our, in our city to live here. Charlottesville City Hall and, and, and Michael Payne and, 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 and Lloyd Snook and, 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 and Juan Diego Wade and, 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 and Brian Pinkston and Leah Perrier say we need to get more black and brown and working class people to live in Charlottesville. And the only way we can do this is this zoning change and get more housing stock because extra supply is going to keep prices stable. I mean, but we're going to take 245 apartments from coming on the market, and we're going to use taxpayer dollars to do that. I mean, that's not all. I mean, it, it, all those things are easy things to say, but uh, you know, we've we've heard it time and again on the on on Real Talk about uh, all the red tape, how it is really really difficult to build in Charlottesville. They don't make it easy. Uh, my my dad has direct uh, uh, direct experience with that. Uh, he was part of a uh, part of a company that was trying to build homes, and they were basically uh, the city basically uh, pushed him out of business. They had bonds that wouldn't that weren't getting released. They had your dad was the investor in the company, right? How, he, how, was, he was a business partner. How, he wasn't how, just an investor. Right? He was the owner. He was, I, I mean... You should tell the story. Are you okay to tell the story? You don't have to tell the story if you don't want I to. I mean, I don't know the full details, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but his partner was a, was a home builder. My, my dad is not a home builder, but he, he invested in... Your dad company, had money. Became a partner. Yeah. And he was the one that dealt with the banks. My dad was the one that went and got the, you know, went and got all the stuff, all that kind of stuff done while his partner was, was dealing with the, you know, with the crews and things like that. And they, they basically went out of business for stupid reasons. I mean, it was, you know, like it was the, the city having a problem with X that really wasn't a problem and refusing to release bonds, which meant that uh, their company wasn't able to pay, you know, contractors and investors and other people with money that was rightfully theirs and should have been released and wasn't. And it just, you know, it, it snowballed until finally they just gave up. Do they ever get the money back? I don't, I couldn't tell you um, how, how this all ended up, but you know, they were, they were trying to build homes, more homes for people to buy and live in. And the city doesn't make that easy. So you, you, can, you can... Well, what about the city trying to take two... Up, you can stand up on your soapbox all you want and say, you know, we want affordable housing. But if you're not going to help people build houses, then... Or what about straight up taking 245 apartments offline? Yeah, that too. When the, the apartments mm -hmm. are in a buy right parcel. I understand the floodplain concerns, yeah. and I get that the people around Rivanna River and where this plot of land is don't want a 245-unit apartment coming because right. it's going to turn into a cluster duck, quack, 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 for years. Traffic, congestion, road damage, and High Street, frankly, is one of the most underachieving corridors in the city right now. Everyone knows that. I get the neighborhood being vehemently opposed to this, but the project is by right. Yeah. Government openly says it wants more housing, except in this scenario. This is hypocrisy. Yeah, it's... Uh, this is hypocrisy. It's akin to allowing your child to do something until you decide you don't want them to do it anymore and then beating them for it. There you go. The city of Charlottesville had an appraiser. They utilized taxpayer dollars to get an appraiser to assess the land, the value of the land. That information, according to the Sean Tubbs article in Seville Weekly today, um, does not fall under the Freedom of Information Act. It's exempt because, as Sam Sanders, the deputy city manager, said in Sean's article, it's a working document for the city manager. 
Details will be released as city council eventually considers any action that might include a possible purchase. That's what Sam Sanders said. Wendell Wood, hey Wendell, or Bo Carrington. Wendell or Bo Carrington. This is what I would do if I were you. You got Charlottesville by the short and curlies, man. Ask for a premium for this land, like 5X. And what you can do is utilize the neighborhood outrage during an election year to your advantage to push the deal in your favor. Use political outcry and the pressure that Lloyd Snook and Michael Payne and Brian Pinkston and Juan Diego Wade and Leah Perrier are facing, especially in election year, to your advantage to get a 5 or 10x premium on this. I mean, are you really advised? <laughs> That's ta- taxpayer money. You're, uh, you're you don't think being, Wendell already knows this? Being a little, no, I know. I'm, quite, I know. I'm quite confident Wendell's smarter than me. Right. Okay. I'm quite confident the largest landowner in Almore County is smarter than me and knows how to negotiate better than I do. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm sure Wendell and his family have thought about this. There's outrage in the community about a parcel of land that they own, and they literally are the catbird seat. The same dude that sold the 125,000, uh, that, that sold the, what did John Lowry write? Let me get Johnny Lowry's email out here again. Lowry, dude, John, I have the same question, Johnny Lowry. He says, $58 million for Wendell Wood for 462 acres. That's $125,000 an acre land that is joke land. Not even land in the cool spot. Yeah. We're talking about the forgotten land. Yeah. That's why the spies want to have their headquarters there. Because it's off the beaten path. It's not where the soccer moms are going to Target. Ooh, can we say Target anymore? Can we say the soccer moms are going to Target anymore? Have you seen what's happened to Target stock lately? Are you following that story? No, I'm following Target stock. You've got to follow stock. these stories. Target released, released a new line of clothing attire... Where it's, um, yeah, I gotta choose my, I gotta choose my words carefully on this one. Is it rainbow? I gotta choose my words carefully on this one. Target released a new line of clothing, a female underwear, where the females have a pocket inside their underwear for their penises. Wait, a pocket? Yeah. I, I don't think I said anything wrong there. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure it out. Women's underwear with a tuck-in spot in the women's underwear for male parts. Okay. And then did a campaign around it. A campaign? Ad campaign. I mean, I'm, I'm not Ad sure, campaign. I'm Ad not campaign. sure why anyone would, would have a problem with, uh, with a piece of clothing being sold at Target. I'm not sure why they would make a campaign around it. (laughs) And you're saying that's why their stock price is tanking? Look it up. I'm not, look it up. I mean, just Google Target stock. I mean, I I read constantly. Look at Target stock. You see the the stock chart? Do Target stock. Are you on Target stock? Um, Look at the stock chart. Click the six month marker. What do you see there? What happened? Better yet, click the one-month marker. On May 17th, the stock was a buck 60 a share. Yeah. On June 7th, it's a buck 30. Yeah. It could be a lot worse. I think Target is going to weather the The market storm. cap is down $13 million. $13 billion. $13 billion market cap drop. Mm-hmm. You see what happened to Bud Light? Oh, yeah. What happened to Bud Light? You want to tell them or you want me to tell them? Uh, Bud Light made a truly, truly curious decision to, uh, to bring on some influencer, I think, yeah. uh, who was, I believe, trans, and uh, put him on, put them, I don't know if, what their preferred... Uh, That's... Could keep but going. Put them on beer cans. I mean, it's just a, a truly odd decision. Why? Because Judas is a smart guy. Why is it an odd decision for an advertising campaign like that for Bud Light users? Because who's their target audience? There it is. What are they? 
who are they trying to appeal to there with this is, decision? Keep talking to us. Keep talking to us, Judah. I, I mean, it's keep just, talking to us. It's you know we've we've seen this we've seen this before on on other companies where they just make some decision to jump into a uh, jump into a political discussion that they have no business in, and they just I mean insert foot firmly in mouth. There's no reason, you know, it's like, huh, does this look, up, does this look appealing? Do I want to eat this right now? No, I think I'd rather not stick my foot in my mouth. I think I'll stay out of this. You know, it's, it's, it's just odd. Um, you know, I, there, there's, a, there's a question going, going around right now uh, that I've seen about, you know, where, where, do, where do corporations stand in terms of like you know political discussions and things like that and we we all know that they're gonna they're gonna take up stances uh some of them will take up stances uh big stances small stances and really like what do we care does anyone care what bud light thinks about uh trans policies about any policy the only thing that people unless, care unless it's a policy about you know alcohol Judah's on point. Bud Light's target audience, I would say, is probably 21 to 40-year-old males. I'll take it a step further. Not only Bud Light's target audience is 21 to 40-year-old males, I would bet you that they're probably alpha jock males because this is a cheap beer. I would bet that Bud Light's market, the, the Bud Light customer base is so dominated by men that their customer base is probably 90, maybe even higher, alpha jock males. They put a campaign, global campaign, where they utilize a man, there's a woman, talking about Bud Light, and why man that is a woman loves Bud Light. Whoever put the campaign together didn't realize that 90% of the people that drink Bud Light Alpha Jock Dudes. Alpha Jock Dudes saw this campaign and immediately, what do they do? Backlash. Now Modelo is the number one beer. Wow. Bud Light falls from one. Interestingly, I think uh, Modelo is still owned by InBev, so InBev <laughs> still has the market share, the same owner as Bud Light. But mm. Bud Light drops from one to two. Yeah. When it comes down to it, who is sick and tired of big brands trying to tell us what to do with our politics? I am. I am. When it comes down to it, who is sick and tired of government overstepping their bounds? I am. When it comes down to it, who's sick and tired of, 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 of elected officials saying that parents shouldn't have any say in their children's education. <clears throat> Terry McAuliffe. I am. I am. When it's all said and done, who's sick and tired of a board of visitors telling a university that you love that we should track students and professors' ideology and keep it on an Excel spreadsheet so we have half the student body Republican, half the student body Democrat, half the professorship Democrat, half the professorship Republican. I'm tired of that. Yeah, I saw a... Uh, I saw I'm, I'm going after Dems and Republicans here. It ain't just Dems. I That's saw, you, Glenn Youngkin. I saw someone with, uh, with this written on the, on the back of their car uh, yesterday. Let's make... 1984 just a fiction again that's good <laughs> scary though thank you Steve Harvey Steve Harvey sends me a tweet oh, Steve Harvey thank you um, go to my Twitter account the Kellen Squire the Kellen Squire press conference is going on now Steve sends me a photo Steve Harvey are you going to run an HD 55 Steve's watching the show on Twitter. Are you running an HD 55, Steve Harvey? Can you get the photo he just sent from the Kellen Squire press conference? Let's see. He, he at me. If you go to my, if just click at, you'll see the photo. Kellen Squire 
and oh, look at the, the people he's got behind him. He's got, this is who Kellen Squire has behind him that I know of. Josh Thronberg's there. I see Brian Pinkston. I see Cena McGill. I see Judy Lee. I see Josh Thronberg. I don't know who these other people are next to him. Squire. Tell me, tell me what this is again. On Twitter. Steve sent it to me. If you go to my Twitter profile, Jude has access to it, and you click at, you'll see the photo. Oh, Ginny Hu, thank you, thank you, Ginny Hu. I take it. A, I, I, I left out one. Uh, I left out one uh, little tidbit. Remember, I told you about the uh, the underpants, the the uh, the shorts, the underwear for women that have a package for male parts. I I, I left something out. It, it was it was it was it was also for also had children in, in teen sizes. Now that's just. Ginny who reminded me of that. There were, there were, I w- it, was, it was marketed for children and teens as well. Wow. Target. Should we just leave it at wow? Yeah. I, oh, well, let's leave it at wow. I we should leave it at wow. You're right. I, I'm not really wow. interested in getting in any further into that. <laughs> we'll leave it at wow. We'll leave it out. You get the photo? No. Uh, uh, let's see. He says standard talking points at the Squire. Where's this at you're talking about? Here. <laughs> Are you on me? Hit at. Notifications. It's not, there's no at there. Yes, it is. There it is right there. How is that at? That's the at symbol. He's adding me. No, that's He's a bell. It. Okay, sorry. I could have explained it better. <laughs> See if you can get that photo on screen. That's Harvey at the Kellen Squire press conference at Northside Library today. Hey. This is uh all right. She said I could use her first name only. So I'm just gonna use her first well, she says I prefer anonymous or first name only. So I can use her first name because she said prefer anonymous or first name only. Her name is Christy. She says, I'm watching your show now and I have so many thoughts. I challenge Sarah K. Harris to come on your talk show and try to defend herself, Jerry. The low jabs at Meg and the fact that our school board race is focused on transgender issues is a waste of time. School board, school, academic excellence, SOLs, learning, these are our topics not furthering a social agenda. Our school board should not spend a second on this stuff, nor should our teachers. How does Meg utilize this? She reminds everyone that this is not what school is about. I respect that email, Christy. I'm maintaining your anonymity, I promise. Unfortunately, in this particular race, Dr. Bryce is going to have to answer the transgender communication with parents and teachers topic. Sarah K. Harris, are you watching this program? Sarah K. Harris... If you are not watching this program, someone text, email, or call Sarah K. Harris. I challenge you, Sarah K. Harris, to come on this show and to sit right across from me at that table. I swear on my son's lives that I will do a fair interview with you. There will be no shock jock journalism. I will ask you extremely pointed questions, and I won't back down from you, and I ain't afraid of some BS labels that could head my way from the conversation we have on the show. I ain't afraid of it. But I challenge you, Sarah K. Harris, to come on this show. You're the president of Forward Albemarle. You're on the DEI committee of ACPS. You're a former teacher of ACPS, and you are attacking a school board candidate personally. I challenge Sarah K. Harris. Do you have the courage? Are we on a one shot? You are now. I'm on this camera right yeah. here. Sarah K. Harris, do you have the courage to come on this show? to talk about things with someone that can communicate and articulate an opinion that's different than yours? Or do you prefer to do your commentary behind keyboards in rooms where you're alone 
offering nasty messages about people in the community to do, that are trying to do better things for the community. Do you like the keyboard muscles? There's a seat for you. All right. Today's Wednesday. You want to show that? Yeah, image? we gotta show. We gotta show the video. We literally oh, just the, went. Got, how long did we go? Here's the uh, here's the Squire image. We oh, that's the Squire image. Yeah. Okay. Here's Kellen Squire at Northside Library. He's going on right now. Um, Kellen Squire is now having to do a press conference at Northside Library to explain why a few years ago he was pro. Pro-life? No, was he? Pro-choice. Is he anti-abortion or against abortion? A few years ago, let me see if I can use that brand as a counter-op to try to pull in the Republicans in a red district. I was just using smoke and mirrors when I was saying pro-choice, pro-life. Ah, people misconstrued what I had to say. Sure, I published it on the internet. Yeah, everybody could read it. People are confused now on my stance of abortion. Let me do another press conference. Kellen Squire, come on, dog. Come on, God. Uh, all right, that's all she wrote today. Um, did you show the... Uh, you want to do the video? Yeah, we got to, don't we? Dude, how good was that trout? Amazing? Like, absolutely delectable and delicious? Oh, I wish I could have tried it. I mean, it's the real deal. You should go. It's, it, it looked amazing. No, it's the I, real deal, dude. You I should go. Seriously, I seriously wish I could have I could have taken that plate with me. And here is the uh, and here is the video. You're, you're gonna play the video? Yeah. All right. Before we go, let's close on this. Have you played it yet? No. Okay. We'll end. Let's out on the video. We don't even have to. Oh, you fixed that already? Yeah. All right. Go studio camera. Let's show them the studio. Okay. And then we'll go. I'll out on this. I'm gonna out on this. Um, I think tomorrow Bellamy Brown is on the show. Uh, H, uh, he's running against Dave Norris and Katrina Coulson. Yeah. Bellamy Brown tomorrow. Um, join us for that discussion as we spotlight his campaign. Um, we are unafraid here. We are unabashed here. We will have conversations that matter in this community, and we will stick true to what we believe is a moral compass that is one backed of integrity and character and honesty and a God-fearing mentality. Okay? My moral compass backed by integrity, honesty, the golden rule, and a God-fearing mentality. And I'm unafraid to say that. I am unafraid to say that. If you're looking for something special to do this weekend, this dish right here is one of the best things I've had. It's amazing. The Clifton does it right, man. They do it right. It's one of the best kept secrets. It's in Keswick. And if you want a date night that's going to make your better half special, here's the spot. Let's cue it up. And guys, thank you for joining us. Three, two, one.